on something very special is going on here at your church. It's happening on a spiritual plane, maybe a little bit more behind the scenes than you've been able to see being manifested before you. But you need to trust me when I tell you this. If you miss this season, you're going to feel really, really stupid. Now, since I said stupid, would you, who needs a piece of candy? Would you like a piece of candy? A piece of candy. There you go. You know, I think all of us kind of want the same thing. Terry? Oh, that was so girly. <laughs> Misty? Seriously. I'm embarrassed for you. I think all of us really want the same thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Now, don't let it hit you in the face. Catch it. I think we want our life to be better. These are Withers Original, by the way. That is a grandpa candy, isn't it? Um, I don't think we want to get stuck at 25, 35, 45, 55, 65. No matter if things are good right now, I think we still want our marriage to be better. Now, I mean, you may have a great marriage, but you want the, can the marriage stand to be a little better? Could your finances stand to be a little better? Can the relationship with the in-laws and friends stand to be a little better? You know what I mean? How about the job? Could the job stand to be a little better? Well, so we want the same thing then. We want our life to get better, even though it might be pretty good the way it is right now. We still believe that life can get better, and we should, because, hey, that wasn't our idea. Our Heavenly Father, our Creator God said, I have a plan for you in John 10, 10, and it's that you might live an abundant life. You're not to do life average. You're not to live by just getting by or just in survival mode. You are supposed to live an abundant life. Hey, it was God's idea that you be successful. It was God's idea that you have blessings on your life, that you live a life of favor. It was God's idea that if things are difficult, that you feel comfort, that you feel peace, and that you experience victory. And since it's God's idea, all I have to do is just walk it out. I just have to have enough faith to walk it out. What? His plan. His plan for what? That you and I would have a great life. All I have to do is have enough faith to walk it out. Say that again. All I have to do is have enough faith to walk it out. Say it with me. All I have to do is have enough faith to walk it out. What? His plan for your life, that it might be abundant and it might be good. It's a journey that you're continually moving forward, going from one level to the next level through these transitional spiritual gates that we'll talk about in just a moment. So then if it is God's idea and he's not making this plan up as he goes, it was his original idea for you, what's the problem? Why is it that you and I aren't living it more? Why are we not experiencing it on a daily basis? Well, the answer is because you have an enemy. And the enemy is at war against you, trying to keep you from being blessed, keep you from living an abundant life, keep you from having a great, tremendous marriage. Because the truth is, if you have the kind of life God wants you to live, you are going to be terrible advertisement for the enemy. If your marriage is just rocking and your finances are good and you're happy and you're filled with joy and things are really going good in your life, it makes the enemy's world look bad. The Bible says sin is pleasurable for a season, so he tries to pull you into that. But wait a minute, if you're already living this incredible, pleasurable, wonderful life, it makes this little seasonal thing that the enemy's offering look very minute. So therefore, he's doing everything he can do to give you the opposite. The opposite of what? A great life. The Bible says, Jesus, same verse, 10, 10, where Jesus said, I've come to give you an abundant life. The Bible says that your enemy is here to kill, steal, and destroy. Kill your marriage. Destroy your happiness. Take away things that you love. Make your life miserable. The enemy is trying to take you out. Then Jesus comes back in, and he tells us this. Now, by the way, the enemy is Satan, Lucifer. We call him the devil. He's an enemy. He was kicked out of heaven, and when he went, one-third of all the angels were kicked out with him. And when one-third of all those angels hit the earth, they became demons, the Bible says. Now, these demons have set up a battle, warfare, and an agenda in your, against you, in your neighborhood, in your home, in our cities, in our government. And the Bible tells us that God lets us know that the problem many times in your marriage is not flesh and blood or at the work or at the economy. It's not about that. The Bible says that you are in a demonic warfare. You have a battle going on. You're on a spiritual playing ground, and the enemy is trying to kill, steal, and destroy. Ephesians 6, 12, for your struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not just your mother-in-law. It's not just your boss. There's something more going on here. It says against rulers, those are demons. Against authorities, those are demons. Against powers of this dark world, those are demons. 
and against the spiritual forces of evil. Those are demons in heavenly realms. So that's why Jesus Christ said about himself that he's not just a Savior. He's not just the Son of God. He doesn't just love you, and he's not just crazy about you. But the Bible also says that Jesus is not passive. Now, if you've seen the passion of Christ, you were like me. You were begging Jesus to fight back, right? You were like tall, 10,000 angels, wipe them all out. I mean, just take them and smear their face in the dirt and then let them back up and then go on with your plan. But at least do something, you know what I mean? But Jesus had a plan. He you know, did this for you and I. But the Bible says later on, he tells us that the Lord is not just a Savior of the Son of God. Take a look at it, Exodus chapter 15, verse 3. The Lord is a what? Say it one more time. The Lord is a what? And Yahweh is his name. So he's a warrior and he's fighting. Who's he fighting for? He's fighting for you. Take a look at it, Exodus 14, 14. The Lord himself will what? Fight for who? For you. The Lord himself will fight for you. Who do you got on your side? The Lord. And he's going to do what? He's going to fight for you. Why? Because he knows you're on a spiritual battleground that you can't do on your own. The Bible says that we are to train our weaklings to be warriors. There's nobody on this planet that's in the Lord's army that's allowed to be a wimp. You can't be a crybaby. The Bible says to train even your weaklings to be warriors. The Bible says that the Lord will know that you are called to his, that you are one of his warriors when you fight first in his, his battles. God, the, our Lord, is a warrior fighting for you because you have to know you are in a fight. Please tell me you know that. Do you know there is a warfare? Do you know something's coming against your marriage and it's not just her attitude? Do you know that you got something coming against your marriage and it's just not his lack of knowing how to live with a woman? Do you know something's coming against your money and it's not just a job trying to hold you down to a certain wage? Do you understand that your kids, your teenagers have something that's coming against them? Do you understand there's a war going against your mind and it's the greatest warfare that you will ever face on this planet? Please tell me you know you're in a battle. Would you raise your hand if you know you're in a battle? Okay, you're on a battleground, you're in a battle. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, we have the story of David. David was the eighth son of Jesse, and he's told by his dad to take some food to the lines and feed his uh, three oldest brothers. His three oldest brothers were fighting as elite gladiators in Saul's army against the Philistines. Philistines had a weapon of warfare. That weapon of warfare was a man by the name of Goliath, who the Bible refers to as a giant. He was a weapon of mass destruction. He was used by the Philistines to drive the Israelites back into captivity to capture the children of God, to put them back where he felt and they felt they belonged, and to take away their territory. They were fighting now gladiator to gladiator. It wasn't like there was, you know, 100, 1,000 people on the field at one time. It was one gladiator would step out against another one, and Goliath was the man of the day. He was stepping out for 40 days in a row, challenging any of the children of Israel to come out and fight him, and they would just call it the day. They said, Who, whichever one uh, wins, we don't all have to fight. Let's just send your best, we'll send our best, and we'll call it good. But no one would come out. The Bible says when Goliath would step out and start hollering at the people, that God's people, God's children would literally fall back. David is on the scene because he's running an errand. He's a gopher boy at the time. He was out taking care of his father's sheep, taking care of the goats. His dad said, run an errand. He said, yes, sir. Even though he knew that there was a call of God in his life, he would be something greater. He humbled himself, and he, and he succumbed to very, very humble beginnings to do Uh, what he was doing at the time, and he was good with it. He was okay with it, even though something greater was coming. David had no business in the story except for the fact that God had marked him for destiny, and he's heading into, this story is him heading into a season of transition. Where you are and where you have been and what you have been through is training. And like David, listen to me very carefully. You are facing a season of transition. You are right now facing a season of transition. Hear me. Everywhere you've been, everything you've done, everything that's been done to you, what you have gone through was just training ground. Now let me ask you a question. How many of you have been through some stuff in your life? Would you raise your hand? All right. You get a piece of candy. Here you go. David was the least in the crowd, no weapons, no professional training. He had not been to the school of gladiators, and yet he knew something. 
He knew that he had been preparing his whole life for everything to change in an instant. Let me say it again. He'd been preparing his whole life for everything to change in one instant. You have been preparing your whole life for everything to change in one instant. One decision will set you on a path that will take you into a new realm of blessing after blessing after blessing. And you've prepared your whole life for one thing to change everything in an instant. Let's take a look at it. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now the Israelites have been saying on the side screen, I'm going to read some of the story too, but here's what I printed for you. The Israelites have been saying, do you see how this man comes out and he comes out to defy Israel? The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. By the way, God's going to pay you not for being defeated, not for quitting, not for starting something and stopping. God's going to pay winners. God's going to pay you for taking them out, taking the enemy out, not just, not just fighting. If you fight and lose, you lose. But God is going to fight with you, so God knows what the outcome is going to be. And the king says to David, if you kill the man, you're going to have great wealth, and he will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. Well, David asked the man standing near him, oh, what was that? What you say? What's going to happen to the man who you know, takes on this Goliath? What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes the disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And they repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, this is what will be done to the man who kills him. And here it is. You're going to have great prosperity. Your position is immediately going to be changed because you're going to marry into royal, the, the royal family, which is what happens to you and I when we accept Jesus as our personal Savior. We become part of the royal family of God. And he says, then none of your family is ever going to have to pay taxes again. You're going to enter into a time, a season of complete profitability. So you're going to have incredible wealth. You're going to have a change of position. And your life is going to be completely profitable from that point forward. And when Eliab, which is David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with him on the side screen now, he burned with anger and said unto him, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? You got some little piddly thing going on back there, and you're not even doing a good job at that right now. I know how conceited you are. You think you're a lot bigger than you really are, and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch a fight. Now what have I done, said David? Can I even speak? And he turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. Listen to me. Anytime God plants greatness in your heart and family doesn't see it and friends don't see it and coworkers don't see it, turn your back on them and keep going. Don't give them time. Don't give them attention. Don't give them a fight. The greatest way that you can combat your critics is with success. Mm, 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 mm. I'm going to buy this tape myself. Listen to it. Now, David says, he says, then he turned away into someone else and he brought up the same matter. And the men answered him uh, again. I think it's funny. David keeps asking, okay, now what was that? What was that? What you talking about, Willis? What did you say? You tell me that again. Now, I need to know before I put my life on the line. What David said was overheard, and he's talking about he'd take on this guy, this guy to Saul, Saul the king, of course, and Saul sent for him. And David said to Saul, no, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. You see, the only thing David had going for him was courage. God says over and over again in the Bible, take courage. Never let fear overcome you or overwhelm you. God doesn't want fear to ever be a part of your life. To live a courageous life is to live a life of faith. We're called to live a life of faith. When we're on our journey, we're to face things where other people back down, other people shy away from, but as a child of God, you are to be filled with courage. And that's all David had going for him. And when the king saw him, the king thought, man, David, you are way out of your league. See, the king didn't know what David looked like. So the king called him, brought him in, was going to put some armor on him and stuff like that. He sees David, and this is what he says. Let me just read it for you uh, out of the NLT. The Bible says in verse 40, he picked up, oh, let me see, bring, bring it back down here. He said, this is Saul talking. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way that you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since he was a boy. 
But David persisted, and here's his argument. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. Doesn't sound like a very good resume to me. He said, and he said, but when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club, and I rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I cut it by the jaw and club it to death. I've done this with both lions and bears, not one, many. I've done this with both lions and bears. What is that? That's training ground. Was it the school of gladiators? No. It was his own personal life training ground that you've had and that I've had. He said, I club it to death. I've done this with both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defiled the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of a lion and a bear will rescue me from this Philistine. And Saul finally consisted, uh, consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. Now here's the point. God is going to take everything in your past and use it for your future to get you where he wants you to be. God is going to take every heartbreak, every difficult situation, every heartache. God is not making up this plan along the way. He knows where you've been. He knows what you've been through. And he's going to use everything in your life right now in this transition. But is the challenge accepted? Everything you've been through, everything can change in an instant. Because you've been preparing for it your whole life. You see, that's why you need to go back and pick up that lion head off the wall and kiss it right on the nose and say, thank you, Mr. Lion. Thank you for standing in my... You need to go get that bear rug and pick it up by the ears and just give him a big old kiss right on the forehead. Say, thank you for standing in my way. You need to go back to that ex and say, thank you very much. Thank you for giving me a miserable marriage. I appreciate it. I didn't know at the time. But right now, I got the best marriage I could possibly have because you showed me how a bad one looked. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Bad Boss. Thank you for no raise. Thank you for not, not ele- elevating me in the company. Thank you so much. Thank you for betraying me. Thank you for treating me the way you treat me. It was all training ground. I don't need to go back. and I don't need to be bitter about it. I don't need to be feeling bad about it. I just need to be thanking you because that was the training ground. God. I couldn't afford to go to Yale Business School, but thank you for putting me through a school of life because now God's going to take that and put me in places where I could not have gotten had it not been for that bear and that lion in my life. Ah. Uh, David asked the question, what's a man going to get? And then he asked another one, what would you say I'm going to get? Now, if I accept this challenge, what was that one more time that the king's going to give me? Here's my question. Why would the king pay so much? Wealth, no taxes for his entire family, and the marriage of one of his own daughters? In other words, I'm going to make you my son-in-law. Why would the king pay so much? Because it wasn't David's Goliath, it was Saul's Goliath. It wasn't David's fight, it was the king's fight. So so, so the king says this, if you will fight my fight, I will take care of all of your problems, financial, family, and position. If you will put my thing before your thing, I'll put your thing before my thing. Matthew 6, 33. What did God say? God said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and I will give you everything else. Why can't people get that? Why doesn't it make sense? You have the king of kings, God, going, all you got to do is fight my fight. All you got to do is deal with my problem, and then I'll deal with your problems. All you got, listen, your job is just a means to be able to provide for your family. That's not your main thing. God's saying, seek first the kingdom of God. Make sure you use the me to put an arm around a person, to talk to somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ, to share your story with somebody else, to minister to somebody else, to shake a hand, to work a door, to to be there. You make the kingdom work of God, which is seeing people saved and growing in a relationship with God, to see more people saved, to grow in a relationship. You make my thing your thing. 
and I will take care of all your problems. And I'm like, why can't everybody in the room get that? You put the first 10% of all the money I give you into the kingdom work of God, and I'll give you more. And you're like, well, that don't make sense. Why doesn't that make sense? Serving the Lord, doing something for God, being part of the kingdom work of God. You make that first in your life, and God says, then I'll give you what you've been working for. See, you try to get it on your own, you can't get it. You get what I want done, done, and then I'll give you what you've been trying to get on your own. I don't understand people who don't understand that. God created you. He made you. Your life could be so much easier. It's not going to be without a battle, but your life could be so much easier if you just say, God, today, your stuff first. So I'll be paying attention. If my boss says something where I can lead in with maybe offering to pray for him, I'll do it. If somebody on the job says that they're going through something or maybe one of their family members is having, having surgery, I'll say, well, come on over here, man. Let's pray for them real quick. I'll let them know that you have a witness on the job. I am here for you, God. I'm about your kingdom. And God says, okay. <laughs> then watch what I do for you in that company. Watch how I bless you. I see it all the time. I see a woman who's had terrible relationships, and, and I'm like, okay, man, why don't, you, why don't you just put God first, tuck into him, and let God let you trip over your knight in shining armor. He's like, well, I don't know. You know, I'm on three websites, and I'm going to go down to the bar tonight. I heard that down at the, is, is the row still here in town? Okay, <laughs> that's how far. I should have asked him where the bars were. I, I should. <laughs> I don't even know. I'm going to go down to this bar, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to meet. The, I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's where you met your last three losers. Why don't you tuck into God and let God just serve him, love him, be a part of the kingdom of God, and let him give you that which you've been going for. Let him give it to you. Has any of you seen the Geico commercial where the people are in a horror movie? And, and, and you know what I'm saying? And, and, and they're running, and one of them goes, let's go hide in the attic. And the other one says, no, why don't we just get in the running car? And they go, that's a stupid idea. Let's go hide behind the chainsaws. And they go all in, they run and hide behind. And you're thinking, you are so stupid. And I'm thinking, how in the world? Does anybody have people in their family that should be in that commercial because they make the stupidest decisions one right after another? I know that was a little hard. I'll give you some candy. All right, back to being nice. Why can't people see it? That when you do God's stuff first, God blesses you. Well, I come to church once every month. Or get, what? God first in your money, God first in your worship, God first in your love. I woke up this morning, my first words out of my mouth was, God, I love you. And I love this woman right here. But I can't do this if I don't do that. She won't love me back if I don't do that. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. But I mean, why? How do people make the same stupid decisions over and over again, thinking that they're going to go get what they want, when if you want what you want, then do what he wants, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Oh, my gosh. Get that. Now, is that challenge accepted? Because it'll change everything if it is. Now, listen to me. The transition that takes you to the next level of blessing will always have a Goliath at it. The transition that takes you to the next level of blessing, blessing will always have a Goliath at it. Let me explain something to you. You go from one spiritual gate to another, but you can't see spiritual gates. Okay, hear me now. You can't see a spiritual gate that opens up to your next level of blessings. David hit a spiritual gate. He's in the field taking care of sheep and lambs. He steps out into this area. He sees a Goliath. It is a spiritual gate. David never goes back home. He goes into the kingdom. After he kills Goliath, the king says, hey, what's your daddy's name? And he's my dad's name, Jesse. He blessed the whole family. 
David's life changed forever because he was at a transition when he faced Goliath. Now listen very carefully. You cannot see spiritual gates. They're spiritual. So how do you know I'm about to head into woo, a whole nother level of blessing? How do I know it? You can't see spiritual gates. So you look for the Goliaths. Anytime you're about to face a gigantic transition, you'll face a gigantic opposition. And the opposition is just the opportunity to go to the next level. But th- am I making you nervous? But that's why, that's why people back up. Listen, run from your Goliath, run from your gate. Run from the Goliath. Run from the gate. I got a difficult thing on the job. I I think I'm going to quit it. No, 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 no. Accept the challenge. Well, I've got an ex and that ex, I got a blended family issue and now I don't know. Run from the Goliath, run from the gate. Take on the Goliath, go to the next level. It's just a gate. There's nothing scary about it. Well, it looks all scary. It's a bear. It's a lion. The Lord said, I will fight for you. You just take it on. I'll make you win. And then that will tell me I can trust you to put you in the next field. I'm a hunter. I've been out in fields almost all my life. I go into fields sometimes late at night, early in the morning. I can't see nothing. And there's noises and there's things in the woods that scare me. I have never ran into a gate I was scared of. Not one. It's just a gate. Run from the Goliath. Run from the gate. One more point and we're out of here. David starts trash talking. This is one of my favorite part of the stories because I'm a trash talker. Have been all my life. Don't have a problem with it. I enjoy it. He goes before the king. King says, here, put on this armor. He puts on this armor. It won't fit him. He says, I can't fight in this stuff. So he picked up five smooth stones from the stream, and he put it into the shepherd's bag. And then armed only with a shepherd's staff and a sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him. And when you picture in your head, do you see a giant and do you see David? Mm-mm. What you got is you got this guy out here with a shield moving in on David. And you've got Goliath behind the shield and this man. You see David charging both of them. Goliath walked out toward David with a shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog? He roared at David that you come to me with a stick. And he cursed David by the names of his G, little G-O-D-S, his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals, Goliath yelled. David replied to Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of the heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you defile. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I'll kill you, and I'll cut off your head. Oh, 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 David, what are you going to cut his head off with? You got a stick and a sling. Your trash talking went to a whole nother level. He throws a stone, hits the giant, sinks it in his forehead. The giant goes down. He goes over to the giant. He takes his sword, and he cuts off his head with it. He uses against the enemy what the enemy was going to use against him. Pastor, I just, I don't have, I don't have what I need to be able to do what God wants me to do. And you won't until you take what you have and use what you have, and God will then add to you what you need in the middle of the fight. Don't take on the fight. Don't get what you need. That's faith. I don't got enough money. I don't know what I'm going to do. Did you make 100 bucks? Give 10 of it. Well, if I give 10, I don't know. What to... You'll have what you need when you take what you have to get where God wants you to get. He'll provide it along the way. It's faith. It's not about having it in advance. Oh, man. But here's the question. 
Do you accept a challenge? Do you accept a challenge? Fight with what you've got. God to add to what you have, what you need. Would you bow your heads, please? Bow your heads with me. Whatever that giant obstacle is ahead of you, it's the gate to the next level. Run from it, you're running from the gate. Run from it, you're running from the gate. Take it on, take it out. Take it on and take it out. Stop being a crybaby. Stop being a weakling. God said train even your weaklings to be warriors. This is warrior training, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Take it on. Take it out. It's a gate. I ran from one gate in my life 12, 13 years ago, my wife and I. had planned to do something that could have set us up a little bit better financially. And the second I got to the gate, the path got hard. And it didn't feel it. It hit me full force. I was tired. I was worn out. The last thing I needed was a fight. See, God said that the path of the righteous will be made easy, smooth. But the enemy didn't say that. The enemy didn't promise you that. And the enemy's not going to let that happen. And I remember I was tired. My tanks were empty. I was out of fuel. And I walked back away from that gate, and it cost Ann and I. It cost us. It did. Could have been, it could have been a financial windfall for us. God's given it back to us. But, but I told him, I told him, I told God, I said, I will never, I will never back down from another giant of opposition. Because here's the cool thing about giants. They're markers to let you know you're going the right direction. They're just a marker. I can't see the gate, so when I run into the giant, I'm like, oh, you little booger, there you are. I've been looking for you. Take him out. Take him on. Don't run from a gate. Challenge accepted. How many of you right now have the picture of your opposition, your giant in your head? You can visualize your Goliath right now. Would you raise your hand? I visualize my Goliath right now. It's just a gate. That's it. You're guaranteed to win. It takes courage to walk a life of faith. Take them on. Take them out. And you will set yourself and your family on a path that will blow your mind. Take them on. Take them out. Father, right now in this room, there are marriage issues. There are financial issues. There are challenges and obstacles, opposition coming against your children from living a blessed life. Their blessed life is being blocked by opposition that is no more than a gate. It is a spiritual transition into the next level. You just got to know that you, tr you can trust us enough to walk forward in courage. And so, Father, I pray over every person in our, this room that you would bless them in a great way. To take it on and to take it out. To take it on and to take it out and to let their whole family be blessed by one man or one woman's courage to step forward with what they have when it isn't enough and to believe and receive what you have that they need that they will only get in the middle of a battle where they have accepted the challenge. And I pray this over my brothers and sisters in Jesus' name. Amen.